Somebody say, did you come to learn tonight? Did you come to learn? Hallelujah. God is doing great things. I believe he is. Bishop, I don't know, is he? Yeah, he's doing great things, trust me. God is doing good things. If you weren't on the conference call today, you want to write down this number and make sure you get on this and hear the replay. I'll talk a little bit about it tonight, but it was just a great conference call today. Every Wednesday at 12, you can listen live as we teach the Word of God. Uh, 30-minute leadership. And just to let you know, it doesn't mean you have to be in leadership. We have... Sh- uh, Lay people that are on there, doctors are on there. Ohio, we had people calling in. Ohio was in on the phone today. We had Newburgh, New York on the phone. Brooklyn was on the phone today. We have so many people around the world that are connected to this house and this ministry. We're international, and you have no idea how much God is going to send a harvest back to you for all the people we're reaching around the world. Amen? Hallelujah. I want to tell you about a book. If you haven't read it, it's called I Am Faithful. It's a revised and updated book that I haven't had out in a long time. It's been kind of sitting up in hiatus, and I pulled it out a while ago and began to rewrite it and redo it. And it really deals with the faithfulness of God and that no matter where you are, what you're going through, that God will be faithful. How many of you know we need a faithful God right now in our lives? And so uh, you need to go out and get it. Also, I got some more of my t-shirts in. How many like my t-shirt? Favor. Walk in it. When are you going to walk in some favor? You wear this shirt, you're going to walk in favor because it says it right here. Everywhere you go, it's going to say favor. $10. Is it 10 What's we selling for? 12 10 What are we selling for? 12 out of town? What are you saying? 10 in town? 12 out of town? <laughs> okay. I'll let you have it for 10 tonight, but if you pay 12 you're not getting a refund. Now we take it as a seed in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. Who was on the call today? What a good call today. You know, I, I, I talked to you Sunday out of Jeremiah 17 where God said, I search the heart, but I test the mind. I search the heart, but I test the mind. I want to talk to you some more about your mind Because I think some of the things that we're fighting is not a devil, it's a personality. It's something in your brain that we've got to conquer. Amen? Go to Luke chapter 22 just for a moment. I want to drop you on a text. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Awesome, band. You're awesome. I know you want to take some notes. You want to listen for a little bit. I won't be long, but uh, I know we got practice tonight. I was very angry. I get very angry, you know, when I see people. Uh, we had that death of Dr. Miles Monroe, and, and it, it was tragic. Um, human error is what killed him, not God. So I'm going to say, well, God was ready to take him home. Well, God didn't take Dr. Miles Monroe home. If, and if, if, how could we believe that if God's ready to take you home, he's going to blow you up all over a runway? I said, like, no. It was human error. The pilot uh, didn't see the crane or, or didn't adjust his altimeter and, cra- and hit a hit a, a, cra- a a construction crane flying too low because of inclement weather, which probably should have been flying. And you, you have no idea how much tragedy and error we have to live through because of this saying, what the mind becomes familiar with, the mind decides to ignore. And if you'll ever get this in your spirit, that you have to continuously keep your mind in check when you're in routine. Routine is a good thing, but routine is also a dangerous thing. Routine in your marriage, you when you start when your mind becomes familiar with your spouse, your mind begins to ignore your spouse and you forget all the reasons why you got married and what you're about, what the team when when you become familiar with certain things, uh, your mind begins to stop recognizing it. Uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Todd Kuntz, is a, a pilot, and when we, we fly together, he'll call me up. I don't like flying in, in that little plane, but when we did fly in that plane, we'd walk around the whole plane, and, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd leak the gas and, and check it for water. We, we uh, you know, 
go and check all the, the rudders, and then we check the tires, and then we, we pull the oil stick out and check the oil. Here's why. Because when you're in the air, you can't pull over and get gas. Right? And so we did it every time we went somewhere. But he was talking to me one time, and he said, when you keep flying, you keep doing things over and over, what happens is pilots, uh, he, well, he called me up one day, and he said, I'll tell you what, I was uh, got in my plane. He said, I started going down the runway. I hadn't did my walk around, and I thought, well, uh, I'm sure the pilot before me did it. He said, but I felt real checked in my spirit. And he said, so I, I decided just to go ahead and do it anyways, and I got out of it. And he said, I walked to the back of the rudder, and I went to pull it, and it fell off. And he said, had I took off, I would have crashed. What the mind becomes familiar with the mind begins to ignore. And when this happens, for instance, if he would have not got out, he felt this impression in his spirit, you need to check this, but we, we're so in a hurry, I'll do it later. How many of you have been in a car and you're praying, oh, please don't run out of gas, please don't run out of gas, please don't get, Lord, Lord, fill it up, God, give me faith. Y'all ain't never done that with the gas on the E? Lord, give me faith. Lord, Lord, God, I need a miracle right now. Lord, I, I need a miracle. Lord, just get me. Lord, just get me to the job. I'll get gas when I get home. And Lord said, no, you better get gas now because that, that thing it, empty doesn't mean extra. It doesn't mean enough. It means empty. <laughs> See, but we push the limits, and then we're mad at God when, when, the, when the era comes. Go Luke 22 just for a minute. I want to I want to drop a verse on you because it's still very important to me. In Luke 22... Jesus says, verse 28, but you are those who have continued with me in my trials because you are those who continue with me in my trials. So he says, because you've continued, you, you stayed faithful. Because you stayed faithful, you continued. Write down the word endurance, continued. God says, I'm going to do something with those who remain in trial. Those who Go through some stuff with their homes, but keep coming to church. Don't get those businessmen that, even though they're busy, make God important, make his house important. Uh, I had people say to me, oh, it's the Christmas season. You might not see me at church much because we're so busy getting ready for Christmas. Isn't Christmas all about church, all about Jesus? You're going to miss church to get ready for Christmas. Does that make any licking sense to anybody? That's religious, isn't it? So he said those, they continued. They kept doing it. It's uncomfortable. It's in the trial. He gives them verse 29. See, I and I bestow upon you a kingdom just as my father bestowed one upon me. Now, this word bestowed is a very important word, and I can't get you to your brain if I don't get you to understand what God's trying to do with you. Okay, And what God's trying to do you, with you is this bestowed in the Greek. In the Greek, this word is channeled. So he said this. He said, because you continued with me, because you're, you've proven yourself through my trials, you're still here, you're still doing what I've asked you to do, I'm going to do something and let you know what we're doing here. And what the kingdom is doing is making you a channel where God can work kingdom through you. And now we got to qualify just because you come to church doesn't mean you qualify for this bestowed a bestowed anointing. You got to you got to continue. You got to overcome things. You got to walk in love. You can't let uh, somebody's infractions bring you out of your walk with God. As you continue in your trials, he said, "I'm going to bestow upon you the kingdom." Channel. Look at somebody say he's going to channel the kingdom. So he's going to channel it. So this this what you have to understand is this word channel. Because there was a time before Christ when heaven's resources, heaven's power, heaven's, uh, heaven's uh, healing was all off limits to humans. When man fell in the garden, heaven became blocked to man. And that's why hell was running havoc on the earth. And people were becoming demon possessed. And you don't see a lot of demon possession right now like you did back in Jesus' day because there was no restraint on the enemy. Now we have a restraint. Why? Because the kingdom is not in heaven. The kingdom's being channeled through us. So it's very important that we take this very, very serious. Because the more we realize that Jesus is channeling his kingdom through us, the more we're going to line up to his will and his word. 
All right? Now, Matthew 25 is the kicker. Because I was up this morning reading Matthew 25. And this channel thing got through me. And, it, and God said, if I'm going to use you, and I'm going I'm to use a word here, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but if I'm going to use you as a medium, where I, a medium where I use you to speak for me. I use you to talk for me. Think about that privilege for a moment, that God is using you as his witness on the earth. He didn't come. He's staying there using, he's using you as a witness on the earth. Now you have to ask yourself, what kind of witness have I represented of him? I'm letting you talk for me. What kind of words have come out your mouth? I'm letting you help me influence others of my kingdom. You're my medium. Okay? So, if we don't heal our brains, we're not going to stop our mouths, our actions, our feelings, and our attitudes. So, Matthew 25, Jesus starts really teaching his disciples and he's talking to them. And he gets into verse 14 and he starts going for the kingdom of heaven is like in a man traveling in a far country. So he starts dropping the, the kingdom bomb on, on them and what's going on. And he gets to 29, uh, ver, uh, uh, Matthew 25, 29. And man, it just, it throws a ratchet in understanding. I want to start up, we'll start up uh at, at, well, at, four, at 14, he talks about the seed and all, but, but we'll get to 27. And so you ought to have deposited, he gets to the talents. I'm trying to get you there without spending hours reading the scriptures. But he, he starts talking about the kingdom of heaven is like this. And he talks about, how many of you know about the talents? You know what I'm talking about, one talent? Well, some of you don't, I guess, because you're not raising your hand. So let me just read it to you. So he received the five. So he said, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants. And delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents. To another two. And to another one. He gave them money. Talents worth of money. It's not gifts. It's money. To each according to his own ability. Notice that he gives you the quantity of production by your ability. He gave one one, one two, one five. According to your ability. Okay. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them, and he made another five talents. And likewise, he had received two gained uh, two more. So the five gained five, and the two gained two. But he who had received the one talent went and dug it in the ground and hid it, hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord, uh, those servant of the servants, came and settled accounts with them. This is all talking prophetically because there's coming a day where God's going to settle the accounts of the things he gave you. Okay? So you're not going to get off the hook. You don't like, God's going to settle these accounts. So he comes and he sells accounts. So he, he who had the five talents, he came and he brought five other talents saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents. I increased myself besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you a ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Notice the joy of the Lord is the reward. He also had received the, the two talents, came to him and said, Lord, you delivered me into two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. They both get the same reward, okay, for increase. Then he had received the one talent, came and he said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. He's bragging on them. So he's, he's trying to make them feel good. And I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent, your money in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. So he said, look, I didn't do anything with it, but I didn't lose it. He said, here, I give it back to you. It's yours. But now here's where Jesus gets harsh. Because he's teaching them a parable. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, and I gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with a banker, and at my coming I would have received back my own with at least interest. Now, here's the kingdom. Jesus says, here's what the master did. Therefore, take the money 
from him. Take what I gave him. Take it from him right now and give it to him who has ten. Now, that's completely contrary to what, you're, what church is all about in America and everything, that we ought to be comforting everybody. Here's what Jesus said. Because this man failed to increase himself, God called him wicked. And said, take from him what I gave him. And give it to the guy who can bring the most increase to it. Give it to the ten, the guy that has ten talents. And then he hits him. With this verse that nobody has an understanding over. For to everyone who has more will be given. And he, okay, and he will have what? Okay, but, here's a but. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be what? Well, wait a minute. How can you take away something from someone who has not? Because the scripture says, what, even what he has, but it says right before that, who does not have. Then it says to the guy in the front of it, everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have what? So if I was reading this passage... Wouldn't you think it would behoove us as believers to stop for a moment and ask this question? What is the meaning of has? Because has is the key for abundance. So we read it, go right over it. But something is being said here that was getting my mind whirling today. I begin to ask the Holy Spirit, then what is in the meaning of has because there's something they have that's creating more. And there's another group of people who don't have it. And it's causing them to be have less. And so me asking these questions, it creates in me the answer. So I start studying. I want to bring this up on the Message Bible before I give you a few more minutes of this teaching. I want you to read this passage. Is, are we able to bring up the Message Bible? I, the Message Bible kind of whoops our rear end. Take the thousand and give it to the one who risked the most and get rid of this play it safe who won't go out on a limb and throw him out into the utter darkness. That's what God said to that man. He said, take the thousand and give it to the one who risked the most and get rid of this. It sounds very unchristlike, don't it? But Christ is telling the story, so don't get mad, okay? This play it safe who won't go out on a limb and throw him out. He said throw him out. Get rid of him. Do you know how many people in church right now God would probably throw out? But verse 29, listen to this. Is that together, 28, 29? So when he finally arrives, okay, 28 and 29. I forget how the message Bible does it. doesn't really break it. It takes it into content. But I, 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 really, I really want you to understand this, that I begin to ask this question, and lo and behold, I find out that psychiatrists, scientists, economists, Doctors, that they all have done a study on Matthew 25, 29, and they call it the Matthew effect. And they begin in 1968, this doctor begins to study Matthew 25, 29, and he came up with this coin phrase, and we know it, everybody's heard it now since 1968, but here's where it came from in 1968. Finish it if you've ever heard it. The rich get and the if you ever, how many's ever heard that? Say it again. The and the poor. So with that statement, he brought it out of Matthew twenty five twenty nine, and he's he came to the study that it's not that the poor 
don't have the ability to be rich, but there's something that happens in the rich that's not happening in the poor. And it's something in the ability that what they have, they recognize and grow. Okay, I know, I know it's thick, but stay with me. Many live life, many are living life to exist. And few are living life to excel. Because the difference between an existing life and an excelling life is effort. It's willingness to change. And it has nothing to do about prayer. Though prayer will help. If you don't recognize where your brain is off, prayer ain't going to help you. Because you got to get your mind back in an understanding that something in me has decided to exist where I ought to be excelling. So they did a study. They, they started doing a study about this Matthew effect. He who has gets more. He who has not, what he has is taken from him. And it's all, and so they started looking at athletes because they said, well, let's look at a study group. So they started looking at a study group and they said, well, let's look at athletes because at the, the MMLB or the NFL, they all got money. They all, they all come in with about the same talent. They got, I mean, I mean, sure, some are better than others. But by far, if you're, if you're a, a, a first stringer in the NFL, you, you've, out, you've played through college in your big division, big D1, and you pretty much become the cream of the what? Okay, so they said, let's do a study on this, this, this group of athletes uh, and let's monitor them because they found out that some had long careers, but most of them only played about four or five years. However, they all had talent. They all had ability. There was something in the brain of the few uh, that gave them longevity of wealth uh, that wasn't in the brain of the many that they only got just there and quit and they all lost everything they had and find out they were flipping hamburgers and, and yet they had me. So here's the kicker. The answer to your problem is not more money because they had the money and lost it. Listen to this. People that win the lottery. Did you know that most of the people that win the lottery, the, I'm talking about them $100 million winners, uh, within 10 years have lost it all and are worse off financially than they were before they won the lottery. So money's not the answer because they got $100 million. If they don't get something in their brain adjusted, they can't hold on to it, it, this scripture, the, the Matthew effect takes place. Even though he has, even what he has is taken away. For instance, they, they found out, let, let, me, let me read something to you when I, when I was looking at this because I'm trying to get an answer about uh, even like with my children. I'm, I'm seeking truth for where my, my children are in their lives and why, why, why are they not better off or, or, or think different. So, their lives causing me to look deeper inside the word of God to get answers on why they can't get out. Because it doesn't matter if I'm out. It doesn't matter if I pray for you in this altar. It doesn't matter if I take you and counsel you for hours. If you don't turn that thing on in your brain, you're going to keep sleeping around. It doesn't matter if you come up here and cry. You're going to go right back over there with your baby daddy or baby mommy, whatever you call them people. You'll be right back over in the apartment, right back on the couch. You'll be right back in the premarital sex. Why? Because you haven't turned something on here. I'm, I'm trying to help you. Well, 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 I just need deliverance. You don't need deliverance. You need to wake up your brain. Okay? Well, I'm just angry over it. Well, I can't help you. Listen, because most people are driven by purpose. Few let purpose drive them. Most people are driven by a problem. Few people let their gifting and their assignment be the force of their decision. 
it goes back to that same two words. Most people are conditional. Few people are positional. It's a powerful teaching. Because if I can ever get you to stop having a conditional freedom that you're only free when you feel free, you only love when you feel love, you only have faith when you feel faith, you're only a conqueror when you feel like a conqueror, then you're going to be in that group of people that are always at the back end of the prayer line or always in the prayer line because you can't get the victory over your life. Because days sometimes just go bad. And just because the condition's bad don't mean your mind has to go with it. Oh, hallelujah. Get a hold of your brain. Look at somebody say, get that stinking thinking out. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The Matthew effect. Something in this, 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 this group that has, okay? Here's, here's something they, they did a study. Here's, here's what they studied about these people. Guys in high school, well, I'll, 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 use, I'll use my son as an example because he had some talent, he had some gifts, but I, I'm getting clarity on some thoughts. There's people that play football in high school, okay? They're good, they play, but they're only living for high school, okay? But there's a group in that group that wants to go to college, and so in their present season of football or athleticism they're making every decision not based on the fun of the now but on wanting to go to college so they do everything in their academics to get there they talk to counselors so everything in their now is thinking of their future so they make decisions now that create the future so that when they get to college they get better in college my son graduates high school, but he's only thought about high school. He ain't thinking about college. He ain't thinking about his grades. Uh, gets to go one year in football in college and doesn't last. So him that has, it was taken away. Now he lives in regret. Now he walks around trying to get back what he had. That's how most Christians live. You keep trying to get back what you lost and never stop and realize uh, until you get a desire for your next season, you ain't never going to get there. He who has. Is this making any sense to y'all? He lives. It, 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 you're living in now. The, the, what is the one word? What is the one word I'm, uh, that I think will get you more? It's faith. The whole kingdom's working on faith. Because you, the, the real truth about faith is that when you walk in faith, the mind begins to feel like it's a risk. And when you're feeling like you're taking a risk, that's when you're working Matthew 25, 29. When you try to sow a seed that's bigger than your house payment, that's going to feel like risk. It, it, let me read this to you, what this psychiatrist wrote about it. People who create chaotic environment in their now. They don't make decisions on order. Let, let, me, let me just show you something. Solomon, richest man, richest man. Let me just show you, let me just show you a little passage real quick. Let me just show you something. This, is, this, this will explain it all. So, Solomon explains it all in Proverbs 6. Watch what he says. Proverbs 6, 6. What he says. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider your ways and be wise. Which having no captain, overseer, or ruler provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, O sluggard? When, when will you rise from your sleep? When will you stop being lazy? When will you get up? When will you wake up? I just say, when are you going to stop making excuses over your life? Get up. Why? Because if you don't, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. This is why everybody's in need. This is why there's no power in the church. Because you sit around slumbering. You sit around lazy. You're not getting in the most important grade in school. This is crazy. It's the third grade. Did you know that? Did you know they did a study of all 12 of the grades that we had to go through? Some of us 13, but we won't brag. 
The most important grade in school is the third grade. Doing this study, that because of this study, some states have put a qualification at the third grade and won't let you pass it until you figure out this one thing. Here's what they said. Up to the third grade, people are learning how to read. After the third grade, they have to read to learn. And the difference is this. If a student struggles in the third grade and learning how to read... He will build or she will build a disinterest for reading so that after the third grade, school shifts in that you read to learn. You start reading factual books and things that train the mind. That mind get brain gets shut down and they struggle in school. They make D's and F's and they never read another book the rest of their life. And everything's about reading even the Bible. You have to read. And so they said, we need to test people. If the student is not ready to read, to learn, we don't need to pass them. We need to stay with them until that thing clicks in their mind. Because if you don't, they build a distaste for increase. That's a good teaching right there, isn't it? What, what, what if I was in, because I'm in that third grade, you know, I read, I read eighth grade in high school, in 12th grade, I was reading eighth grade level, so I was way behind. And you know what's funny? I didn't like to read, I never did read, but when I got saved, the first thing I did was buy a Bible and couldn't hardly read it. But something in me built a desire to read when I, because the Holy Ghost knew I needed to shift on that thing in my brain that if I didn't learn, read to learn, I wasn't going to increase in my future. How long are you going to sleep? How long are you going to play? How long are you going to slumber? Because poverty's coming on you like a prowl. And, 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 and so your brain, it's your world, your mind. And so these little areas in your mind, dark areas, hurt areas, rejection areas, uh, they're all trying to captivate you and keep you uh, in a past that God's trying to get you out of so that you can have abundance, you can have more. So he says, those that create a chaotic environment, those that, that stay in a chaotic environment, disorder, disordered environment, lazy, houses are wrecked, cars are wrecked, homes out of order, there's no routine in your house, you got no training, you got, you have no uh, routine to learn, you have no routine for prayer, you have no routine for change, you just wake up, you go to work, you come home, the house is a mess, you go to bed with the same mess, the same problem, the same anger, you just, you just learn how to adapt in it, this is what the scientist said, this is what psychiatrist said, those that live in a chaotic environment, encourage in that environment reckless behavior. You will birth this. If you're a father or mother watching me right now, you need to go home and take chaos out of your house because you're creating in your children reckless behavior. They will emulate the environment you've created. Now, if your kids are out of school, out of house, and you didn't know it now, all you can do is work. First John 1 John 1.9, confess your sins and he's faithful. You've you got to repent. Us parents got to repent. Some of us didn't know. But if you got little kids in your house and you're learning this right now, you go home and put order back in your house. And let me tell you something. If I could go back and do things, I would turn that TV off. I'd throw them video games out the window. I would. Su I, I told Marianne, I was driving down the road one day, said, I would lock my kids up in a closet and call them the Duggars. Because what's killing our kids is we're making them grow up too fast. We're giving them information their mind hadn't been able to process. And it ain't the devil. It's us letting them do it. You're with me. You're not mad at me, are you? You're awful quiet. 
If you create a chaotic environment, this is why God is a God of order. This is why you got to put order. You got to put order back in your anger. You don't have a right to flesh out on somebody just because they didn't do what you thought they ought to do. That's chaotic environment. You're creating. You can't take your children and become submissive in discipline. I don't care what kind of children you have. Well, my child's uh, specially gifted. They're, he's not very smart. doesn't matter. If you, if, you, if you cater to their weakness, you'll strengthen their weakness. You see these kids with no feet, no arms, and they're doing things, and they have great self-image and great identity, but they don't have what all the other kids have because parents put the law down in the house. And say, You're not going to make having no arms an excuse. You're not going to make having a sickness an excuse. Because you got to live out there when I ain't here. You see? You see what I'm saying? Well, that's just hard. Well, it's called tough love. Say, no, saying no is tough love. That's why God says no when he wants to say yes. It's tough love. It's hard. It's hard. I'm not allowed to you. It's hard to tell your kids no. It's hard. Because the parent's heart is to always want to protect and guard but we're doing an injustice to the next generation because we're not training them on how to discover what they have because God didn't say the one talent, the five, two talent, the five talent. They were all at the ability of increase, so he gave them the load in which he knew their ability could handle. He wasn't expecting the one talent to even have two talents. He wasn't expecting that. He said, you could have put it in the bank and brought me a half a percent more than I gave you and you'd have got the same heavenly reward as these th these other two. But you became lazy. You became afraid. He said, and you, you became sluggish. And in my opinion, he said, you are useless to the kingdom. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to get to the end of all this thing and at the end... And find out that the church God is not the God that, that, that everybody wants us to have. That he's going to be all, everything's going to be okay. No matter what you did, hunky dory. We get there and say, no, you're useless. Get out of here. I told you a hundred times. You didn't want to hear it. You wanted to be comforted. And now it's over. Depart from me. He said, yeah, but Lord, I cast out demons in your name. Lord, I knew. He said, yeah, but I don't know you. And I didn't understand that until I was studying this because he said, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, I did miracles for you. I did feats for you. I went to church for you. I taught Sunday school for you. I ran these cameras for you. I did the sound for you, Lord. I was in ministry for you. And he says, yeah, but I don't know you. You knew me, but I, didn't, I don't know you. And here's what I realized. What he was saying was, yeah, you got involved, but you never opened up your mind where I could channel myself through you. And so you got into me, but I never got back into you. Because we had no intimacy, we didn't grow. Show me what you and I produced. And I'm going to tell you something right now. But, but if, if right now Jesus came on this pulpit and said, point out five people in 12 months that you brought here on your own witness and you begin to disciple. Give me five names of somebody you're discipling right now. Give me two names. Give me one name. Of a person that you're talking to about the kingdom to get them in the kingdom that you're going to bring to church and train them, not waiting for me to do it, or my cameras that we pay for, or the TV that I went and did with Bad Mason, or the books I write, or no, because I'm going to get there and say, here's all these people, and here's my names, and here, and you're going to have to count to yours. And if you think about it, we're so existing, we're not excelling. Now I'm not getting on to you. Don't walk out of here and feel like a hundred pounds of sin on a popsicle stick. I'm telling you, just to, this what, that's what Solomon says. How long are you going to sit there and slumber? How long are you going to sit there and make excuses? Excuses are bridges to failure. That's all they are. How long are you going to keep blaming the clock? I just don't have enough time. You schedule time. Time doesn't schedule you. How long? How many times are you going to keep saying, I don't have time to read the Bible? Make time. I read it. I sit in my office and watch, listen to psychiatrists talk the most boringest stuff. I was in there talking, listening to a guy talk about uh, scanning brains and learning how to understand brain failure. It was the most boringest teaching I've ever sat in. I think I woke up at the end of it. I let it subconsciously feed me somewhere in that thing. 
People say, I don't have enough money. What are you doing about it? That's, 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 that should be the next thing that this church needs to shift to. When somebody comes to the altar and says, y'all pray for my finances. What are you doing about it? What are you doing about not having enough money? Well, I work 20 hours a week. You think 20 hours a week is enough hours to make money? The, the, the only answer for money is work. You do know that, right? If, if prayer was the answer for money, I'd be a millionaire. Because I'm always praying for money. No, money, the answer to money is work. You want more money? you got to find it. Either you got to sell your time for more than you're selling it, so you might have to train your, yourself to get to be able to up the pr- price of your time because that's all you're selling is your time. If you think you're worth $5 an hour, that's all you're going to get. If you think you're, you follow me? It's like that boy went out, went around, was cutting grass, and he goes to his neighbor, knocks on the door and says, listen, I, I want to cut your grass. He said, how much? He said, whatever you want to give me. He said, okay. He said, goes to the next house, next house, so he goes to this millionaire's house, big house. He knocks on the door, guy's richer than everybody in the whole neighborhood. And he says, listen, I want to cut your grass. He says, okay, so I got a pretty big yard. How much? He said, well, whatever you want to give me. He said, well, what's so-and-so giving you across the street? He said, well, he's giving me $3. He said, all right, I'll give you two. And the whole thing was, you said whatever I wanted to give you. You didn't tell me what you were worth. And we think that's humble. Oh, he was being humble. What he's so humble? That little boy, what he's so humble? You just give me what you want to give me. Well, here's two bucks. Cut my five acres. <laughs> And now you'll be out there cutting it, calling him names, saying he should have recognized my value. You didn't recognize your value. You sold yourself cheap, and you're mad at others who who are paying what you sold yourself for. It's the Matthew effect. Go home, look in the mirror, and start telling me yourself what you're worth. First of all, I'm telling you how valuable you are. You're worth God's only son. So you're worth in the heavenly weight. You're worth more than all the gold on the earth. But you have sold yourself into an existing lifestyle, and that is not kingdom. Kingdom is you are. That's what's wrong with my daughter. My daughter does not see herself above where she is. It doesn't matter how much I tell her. It doesn't matter how I show it to her and write it on her. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I sit with you right here, all five of you young people, and try to tell you, do this, do that. You get on a Facebook and argue with me, and you don't know Jack. And I just want to come back and be so mean and say, no wonder you're stupid. No wonder you ain't got nothing. No wonder why you keep waiting for somebody to have bless. That's what I want to say. I don't because I'm more mature than that. I just say, eh. Move on. Well, Bishop, that's awfully black and white. If you don't listen to me, you can go down to another church. You'll still be broke. You'll still be angry. You'll still be sleeping around. You'll still have kids out of wedlock because somebody didn't sit down and tell you, wake up, quit slumbering, and get this thing right. Why? So we can have abundance. I don't know who, who I'm talking to. Maybe I'm talking to myself, but I want a blessed to be a blessing. Who am I talking to? I don't want to quit. Listen, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of swimming in quicksand and and telling everybody I'm going somewhere. I don't want to be the guy that gets out of quicksand, and that's the only testimony I have. Thank God I didn't die in quicksand. I want to stop falling in the pit. I want to change. I want to grow. I want to sow. I want to do. I told God, I don't care. If you want me to sow a hundred, I'll sow a hundred. A hundred thousand, if I have it, I'll sow it. Why? Because I've got to somewhere risk it all. And either believe you are who you say you are or you're not. And if you're not who you say you are, I need to find out now. Or I get to heaven and find out all it's a lie. It's one little shack up there and we're all living on food stamps. <laughs> Where's the walls of Jasper? <laughs> There's a picture of it. <laughs> Either we start believing this book and take it literally or we're all going to fail in the end. This is not allegorical. This is not an opinion. It's not like, well, you, you have your opinion. I have my opinion. This is the word of God. 
Matthew 25, 29 is written there for a reason. He who had, the kingdom is like this, guys. He who has, more will be given. He who has not, even what he has, will be taken away and given to them that have. So in 1968, they came up with this slogan. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And here's what they find out. It's not that the rich don't have something different than the poor. It's that the rich always think about tomorrow and the poor only live for today. That's the ant. Look at the ant. He gathers in summer preparing for winter. You know why people are in debt? They can't tell their wants no. If the bank shut down tonight, if you went home tonight and the grid went off, I ain't talking about some Al-Qaeda terrorist blew something up. I'm talking about a computer fried, a bug. Everything right now is run on computers. You know that, right? And the banks shut down tomorrow and the ATMs close. And how much cash would you have on you? How much cash could you live on right now in your hands? How much you have in your house? How are you going to get water? How you, how, what? Because if the grid goes off, your water quits running. Your toilet quits running. Your refrigerator, the food sours. How much food do you have? See, that's, that's how you have to see where you're at. What are you preparing for? I ain't telling you to run out here and start buying K-rations and big dig, dig a bunker and call yourself Doom Day's Prepper and buy a big old shack somewhere up in, in the, uh, Boone, North Carolina and buy a bunch of rifles and let your beard grow down to here. And I ain't talking like that. What I'm talking about is y- y- you just get up every day, do the same thing, and never even think once of tomorrow. How are you preparing for it? How are you equipping for it? What book are you reading right now for your future? Somebody got relationship problems. Are you studying about relationships? Well, no, I just got relationship problems. How are you going to fix them? No, you'll do is you'll break up with that guy and date somebody just like him and be up here going, I have relational problems. Is it the same relational problems you have with that guy and that guy and that guy? Yeah, well, then if, 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 if Susie has a problem with Jim and then Susie has a problem with Joe and Susie has a problem with Michael and Susie has a problem with Jim, who's the problem? Susie. But she keeps thinking they're all the problem. And then when somebody tries to say, Susie, sit down and talk to you for a moment, baby. What? You the problem. That offends me. Well, I wasn't trying to offend you, but truth always exposes the lie. Okay, I just let me break it down to you. You're just living in stupid and I got to help you. You're dating the same guys just with different names. Well, that makes me mad. I'm going to another church. I just don't like the way you talk to me. Okay, bye. Because we're not going we're not going to handcuff you to the seat, try to beat truth into you. Okay, see you. Have fun. I can't tell you, out of a hundreds that have left my church, I can't tell you that, that this is the truth. Probably ninety percent of them went to a worse season after leaving me. Because the one thing I pride myself on is telling the truth and being doctrinally sound. I ain't my smartest cookie in the jar but I'm smarter than most people in the church about the Word of God. I ain't smarter more than business people, but I can take the Bible and show you how to build your business, fix your marriage. I don't have a problem talking about the, the things in your head. You're not going to offend me. Your sinful lives and anything you bring up in your past doesn't make me and Pastor don't fall on the floor and go, oh, my God, you're a reprobate. You can tell us anything. You won't get people who have been in our offices can't believe how we don't fall apart over your falling apart but we'll tell you the truth okay let's fix it what do you want to do about it how you want to fix it what you willing to do why you want to do that well it ain't going to change then you're going to live in the Matthew effect what you have even what you have is going to be taken away from you and given to them to have and the rich get richer and the poor stay I believe everybody here needs to shift and begin to be the ones that increase their talents. Not just their money, their talents, their giftings. Get involved. Make some effort. And grow your mind. Right? Get through your wounds. If you got some wounds, talk to somebody. Every book I write talks to a wound. Spend some money on your head. This is $10 right here. Spend 10 bucks on your mind. 
You can get in this book. There's a whole chapter just on faith in here. I was reading it today. I read my own books. I was reading it today. And I was teaching it on the... Put that 12 o'clock thing down on your phone and get on and listen. While you're eating your Wendy's burger, listen to the Word of God. Put it on your little ear set. Put it on your speakerphone. Take it to your break room. We got people, I think Pastor David works in a, a factory, don't you? Do you not listen? Was you on today? While you're working, you was listening to the Word, wasn't you? How many times you almost went crazy listening to the Word? I had a pastor today from Newburgh, New York said, I had to pull over and finish this thing to, to, because I was about to have a wreck. The truth that was coming off that phone call today on the Matthew effect. Take accountability. Amen? Put some, get chaos out of your house. Start planning your future. I'm going to read this thing and we got to go. It says, here's the Matthew effect. You create a chaotic environment. It encourages reckless behavior. Then it creates a more unstable environment where people keep their minds off their future, the less forward looking their behavior becomes. That's the Matthew effect. Those who keep looking for their future will get out of their present. Those who accept their present never change. And this is what faith is. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now, faith is the substance of something who knows the word. Evidence of things. I used to think that meant you want to you want it, see it. But God was telling me, they said, no, no, no. What are you hoping for tomorrow? You can't see tomorrow. But if you make decisions today based on tomorrow's effect, you'll make better decisions today. The Chinese have a hundred year goal. If you went to China, if you were in China and you went to a business school, they would train you to start your business with a hundred year goal. We got people in America don't have a one month goal or a one year goal. 2015 is coming upon us within a month and a half. How, who, I can't even believe we're in 2015. I remember 1975, 76. I remember 1980. That's when I graduated. I remember 1988. I remember one time watching uh, uh, one of those uh, space shows in the 80s, 70, 1978, 79, Buck Rogers. And they say, it's the year 1999. I thought, whoa. Oh, Jesus probably come for 1999. Had to be right before the year. And then they come 1999, and everybody's talking about Y2K. Y2K, we're going to blow up. We're going to evaporate. None of the computers. How many of you remember that? Well, buddy, you're in 2014. And in a month and a half, the clock goes click, and guess what it'll be? Okay, so has anybody here or watching has been able to stop the clock for a while? So 2015 is coming. That means you're going to be older. Not me. I, I'm looking younger. I don't know what's wrong with y'all. <laughs> no, just kidding. Why don't you sit this year, this month and a half in 2014? Why don't you pray? Why don't you get a pad out? Why don't you get a journal? If you don't want one, buy one of mine. And why don't you, but with the, the, that before 2015, you write down some goals. Write down, number one, write down what kind of financial goal you want to finish in 2015. What kind of money you want to make? What kind of money you want? What books are you? Write down what, what kind of relationships do you want around you? What kind of thinking do you want to have in 2015? down some goals amen well I don't know if to, to give an altar call or tell you I'm sorry it's it's just saddens me it saddens me when I see ability like my son 
and, I, and him crying last night about finances to me. And, and I'm, I'm financially able to completely eradicate his financial problem. I mean, I could, I could sit down right now and hand him a wad of cash and solve every financial problem he has, but it wouldn't solve it. Because as long as he creates, keeps a chaotic environment, I can't pay your way out of it. If he don't go home and put order in his house and subdue it, he'll never have biblical dominion over it. And nor will you. Go home and run that chaotic demon out of your house. Okay? Now, you might have to go home and clean your closet just to get started. Just to feel good about it. Make some routine. Get up make your bed every day for a month. See how you feel. Some of you done, haven't made that bed in so long, you probably don't even know how to make it. There ain't nothing worse than getting in a messed up bed. I hate it. I like them sheets all be wrinkled. I like them sheets tight when I lay in there. There, listen, there ain't nothing like getting in after them sheets done been washed and cleaned. Some of you ain't washed your sheets in six months. God have mercy. When I was single, I washed my sheets once a year. That's about it. <laughs> hey, I ain't nobody with me. It's by myself. I, de- I didn't make a bed for a long time. I just got up, left it the way it was. But you know what? My whole life was ending up like my morning. I, my life was ending up the way it was every year. When I started putting order in certain little minor things, it made me think order. Clean up your car, pick up stuff in the yard, cut the grass. It was like I'm faithful at certain things, you know, like my garage. I'm constantly sweeping out. Now, I need to do better in the house, I know. But. It's like double stuffed Oreo cookies have become a, like kryptonite to me for some reason. I don't know what's wrong with it. I never had double stuffed. Did y'all know these existed? My son indoctrinated me with gospel truth because we were sitting there, Manny, and I would take the top off the Oreo cookie. You ever done that? And I'd take a top off another one and put two of the white ones, two of the whites together. And make me a two two double the white with the cookie. My son said, "You know they make them like that." <laughs> and I looked at him and said, "What you talking about, Willis?" He said, "Somebody already thought of that because I said I got an idea, Jerry. We ought to find a way to double stuff." I said, "Dad, they make triple stuff called mega stuff." I said, "I got to have them, man. That mega's a thousand times more." And we ran out the other day, and I bought me another pack. But I do discipline. I eat one. I'll eat two. And I put that sucker up. And it be calling me all night. 3 a.m. last night, I woke up. And I heard it saying, I'm in here. I'm milk's favorite cookie. You want some milk? And I had to rebuke it. Shut up, devil. Demon of fatness, get off of me right now. I was supposed to run in there and eat it. It was torment. I went back into the bed, laid there, and thought about it. I said, are you kidding me? And then someone said, maybe you ought to throw them away. I said, the devil is alive. I'm getting victory over this thing right now. In my name of Jesus, they're throwing away them double stuffed cookies. Cost $3.69. Oh, I'm going to get a hold of this discipline. See, everything's predicated on your what you're willing to control your thought life over. You think I would wake up and be thinking of the end of the world or a new message. I, I ain't even thinking about the Word of God. I, I woke up thinking about double stuffed world cookies because I just bought a brand new pack. Freshly sealed pack. That is a new invention. Don't you love that new invention? Seal it right back. You used to have to roll it up, clip it. Wish I'd have thought of that. I'd be a millionaire. If you want more, then change what you're doing right now. 
Father, we love you. I could talk all night. And Lord, I, I, if I didn't teach it fully the way you wanted me to, keep training me, I'll keep teaching it. But I want people to do better. And I don't want to do better because we're beating them into doing better. God, I want people to do better because they desire to be better, want more, do more, have more. I don't care how anybody was raised in this church or watching by way of this internet. You can decide in your mind right now to be better. You don't have to do what daddy did. You can be better. How many believe God can do that right now? Say, I believe it right now. Amen. Look, let's sow our seed. Let's sow our seed. Let me tell you of a seed amount that I just learned about and I sowed it. Luke 252 seed. Never heard of it. Have you ever heard anybody talk about a Luke 252 seed? Do you know what Luke 252 says? Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with man. A pastor friend of mine said that he was taken up, that God told him to sow a $252 Luke 52, 252 seed. Believe in God to walk in favor and stature and in wisdom, not which is God, but with men. I said, I got to sow that. Nobody's ever said that seed to me, $252. So I sowed it. I want you to sow a Luke 252 seed tonight. And if you can't do the $252, if you can, God's blessed you do it, then do 2520 or something, but get get the 252 and write on it Luke 252 that you're going to grow this year in wisdom and stature and favor. If these three areas grow in your life, you'll be a millionaire in 12 months. I'll tell you that right now. Jesus grew. Jesus had to grow in it. That means you got to grow in it. Okay, I sowed it and, and activated it in my seed. You sow it and activate it in yours. Because I always share what I'm doing so to help you. I'm going to sow one tonight. I believe two hundred fifty-two dollars to the church. That I'll grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor of God and man. Amen. So do twenty-five, twenty, or two hundred fifty-two, or however you can get it in there. One hundred twenty-five, twenty, if that you know wherever you are. Sow at your level. Don't ever sow beneath your level because you're trying to go to the next level. Always sow at your level, and your level is never ashamed of it. If five, if if it's a five area level, then sow in it. Don't be ashamed of it because your next level is a hundred or ten. Okay. Hold up your seat. Let's pray over it right into the favor center. Father, according to the word of God, you'll give us the treasures of darkness, hidden riches of secret places, that we might prove that the Lord is our God. Lord, you said in Psalms 112, there will be wealth and riches in our house. We sow seeds as an investment into the kingdom. God, you showed us tonight that when we're willing to risk things, that's when we get the greatest propensity of increase. Now, Father, I'm asking in this Luke 252 seed, that we grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with men and with God. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand to your feet, hug somebody, bring your seeds and lay them up here. If you're watching my way of the internet, of course you are if you're watching me, so it's not if. But watching my way of the internet, you can sow your Luke 252 seed online. But, but let me know you're sowing it. And, and I'm going to be praying for wisdom and stature and favor with God and with men. Expect favor. I took this seat up in Macon, Georgia, under my friend Bishop Ronnie Cotton's and Apostle's house at Tabernacle House of Prayer. And they've already called me today and said the tithe is going up. Membership. They had 20 new visitors Sunday. There's an anointing on this Luke 252, and I want you to get involved in it. You sow it. We love you. Thank you for being a part of the I Church. We'll see you Sunday, 1030 a.m. Take us away, Jeremy.